911, where's your emergency? You need to send paramedics. I think he shot everybody. He has a handgun. He's shooting everybody. Oh. Is that gunfire? I'm just so scared. I'm scared he's going to come try to find me. Please. Information about a deadly rampage in a St. John's County neighborhood. Investigators say James Colley shot and killed his wife and her best friend. You know, there's five children that lost their mothers on that day. Literally, baseball games are attended with an empty blue chair. <sighs> For Lindy to sit in and watch Patrick play. Always take domestic violence seriously because you never know at what point it might escalate and something happen like what happened to Amanda. This is what he's going to tell you. How to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant. It's a planned community with pools. It's a very nice neighborhood, a very nice area of our counties. I mean, the entire portrait of this family just didn't speak to something that would end in such violence and bloodshed. Amanda and J.R. Colley had been married for eight years. She was the life of the party. She was outgoing, gregarious. Everybody wanted to be friends with her. Amanda, she lit up a room and she was gorgeous and confident. I mean, she was the perfect package. She was everything you would want in a friend. James is a very personable man. He, uh, he could easily become a friend with somebody. He worked in the banking industry. He was in. Uh, he was uh, worked in the mortgage department. Kids, he was great. I mean, he spent all the time he could with the kids. He coached their teams. He uh, took them on vacations. But friends began to hear not everything was wonderful at the Collie home. He was jealous of her spending time with friends. You would have to be a strong person to and be very self-confident to be with Amanda because she was so friendly. I think he probably drank too much. You know, if he started drinking, sometimes it was hard to stop. We all have some demons, but I think his probably ran a little deeper and he, he did uh, abuse things on occasion. She tried to make it work as long as she could. And when it came to the point where the scales tipped to where his behavior was affecting the family, then I think that's when she decided that this, this needs to be, we just need to separate, this needs to be over. The separation papers were filed in the middle of July, but JR would still come to visit. It would go from, you know, three days of being a family to three days of don't talk to me, to three days of being a family, to three days stay away from me. It came out in court that they had sex together. And she said, well, I felt like I had to in order to, you know, keep them happy so I wouldn't get hurt. She had a new beau, even though that was something that she kind of kept to herself from her husband. He had a girlfriend. I mean, he had already moved on, but he still didn't want to let go of Amanda. <laughs> On a weekend that Amanda was away, J.R. sneaked into the house. Mad that, you know, thinking whatever he was thinking about where she was and what she was doing. He gathered her clothes out of the closet and burned them in the backyard. That's not normal behavior. Amanda filed for divorce and a temporary injunction to keep J.R. away from the home, writing in the court papers, J.R. would cut me up or kill me if he ever found out I was cheating. And part of the reason why I think it took Amanda so long to take action was because he did try to be a good father to the kids and she did not want to, you know, nobody goes into it wanting to have a divorce. Nobody wants to tear apart their family to be torn apart. JR had asked neighbors in the cul-de-sac to keep an eye on Amanda and the house to report if anyone was visiting her. 
he received this picture from a neighbor of a bare-chested man mowing the lawn at Amanda's house. I mean, I think once he found out that was too much, that was confirmation of, okay, this is the guy. JR also sent messages to the neighbor who had taken the picture. Over the next six hours, Cowley would become increasingly enraged. A neighborhood surveillance camera saw J.R. Cowley's car heading to Amanda's home. Nobody was home. Amanda was not there. He ransacked the house and destroyed TVs and furniture and walls. As he's looking around, he finds uh... He finds clothes, men's clothes, that he knows aren't his. And then he searched some more and he found some, some sex toys that he knew that was never any part of our relationship. And I think that this infuriated him and he began calling Amanda to tell her that he was at the house and he found these things and he was angry. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Really funny, you don't want to talk yet, huh? You know what, we don't need to talk. Don't do nothing to me, I won't do nothing to you. I won't bring you up in court about what you really are. And we both know what you really are. You're lucky I don't tell our children about this, Amanda. You're disgusting. That's what you are. Let me get you to raise your right hand. You just want to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you God. Yes. Collie had been in court that very morning. He was coming to court for a violation of that injunction for having contact with her. The night before, he had uh, he had been drinking. He can't sleep. He takes some Ambien because he'd been prescribed that. Put your hand down. Please tell me your full name. James Sir Collie Jr. Mr. Collie, how old are you, sir? Thirty-five. Have you ever been treated for any mental illness? No. Are you now under the influence of any intoxicants? No. The judge was unaware of Collie's rampage just a few hours earlier at Amanda's home and agreed to let Collie attend anger management classes instead of being sent to jail. This is going to be unsupervised probation. And Mr. Collie, you wish to enter a plea to charge? No contest? Yes, sir. All right, the plea is accepted. Adjudication will be withheld which means this is not a criminal conviction on your record. You'll be placed on 12 months of unsupervised probation with early, early termination if you complete everything early. So he ended up getting a better deal than he had originally uh, anticipated. All right, so in addition to that, you have no violent contact with Amanda Quillanager. Sorry. Mr. Bedwin, is that all you had? That's all I have, Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome, sir. Next case. Next case, Judge. He had his employee badge on, and he was dressed in, like, slacks, collared shirt, like he'd be going to work. And when he left court, he tried to call Amanda. Please talk to me. Please. Amanda, I'm out of court. Please talk to me. Maybe I... I Please, this is the last time I'm calling and begging you, please. She picks up the phone and they have a 14, about a 14 minute phone call. Something happened in that call and instead of going to work, he went and he made us one stop at a gas station, filled up his tank, and then at that point he bought beer. It's now 10:11 in the morning, and J.R. Colley is heading to South Bellagio Drive. 
In the car are two fully loaded guns. St. Johns County Sheriff's Office for Hi, my sister lives at 260 South Bellagio Court. Uh-huh. She has a injunction against her husband. They're going through a divorce. Apparently, he broke into her house about 4, 4.30 this morning and busted every TV in the house. I'm not sure if she called to report it, but I want to make sure. Amanda had returned home and was taking stock of the damage from JR's rampage a few hours earlier. With her was the man she was dating, Lamar, and two friends. Lindy Dobbins and another friend, Rachel Hendricks. And I'm here with Rachel Hendricks. This will be a sworn recorded interview. Rachel would later describe what happened that day at Amanda's house. Gave Amanda a hug immediately. She was crying on my shoulder. Um, she was very upset over the way that the house was trashed mm -hmm. and ransacked. The sheriff's office actually responded to the residents and she declined to write a report. She didn't want to press charges on James because she did not want to have him put in jail for a year and be away from his kids for one year. So the sheriff's officer left the scene. James is traveling to the residents at that point. He parked behind the residence, Amanda and Rachel, Lindy and Lamar are all in the living room kitchen area. They look out the window and see him. I looked over at Lamar, I said, what the hell? <laughs> Lamar saw and, and screamed gunshots and he ran. I never saw him again. Surveillance video from a neighbor shows Lamar running down the street away from the house. Me, Lindy, and Amanda were obviously screaming and um, just screaming, hide, hide. Amanda, Lindy, and Rachel run into the master bathroom suite and hide. Amanda was on the phone with 911. Mommy, not in there. Please stop. <laughs> and I heard James's voice. And he was screaming at Amanda and he wanted to know um, where is he? Where is he? Where the F is he? He was looking for Amanda's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Put that down. Put it down. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> and Lindy was also on the phone with 911 in the closet. 911. Oh my God. Oh my God. Hello. James goes to the closet door and starts trying to get inside. Well, Rachel is holding the door from the inside and he can't get in. And so he says, let me in or I'm going to shoot through this door. Well, he did. Ma'am, ma'am. Is that gunfire? Uh, oh my God. Go ahead. She just said on the other line, somebody said, put it down. It was the same area. So when he came into the closet and he walked past me and walked up to Lindy. She screamed, oh my God, no. And he just shot her. He didn't say anything to her. Nothing, just shot her. Rachel is standing behind the door. So when the door swings open, she's essentially concealed, which point Rachel circles out of the closet and runs. And the whole time I was running, I was thinking, he's gonna, he's gonna shoot me from behind, be prepared to fall. I'm gonna get shot in the back. Not What's the answer? He was in the house shooting, and I ran. I just ran. I mean, he just did paramedics. I think he shot everybody. He has a handgun. He's shooting everybody. I, we've got people coming. I know. I know. It's just. It's I am time. so scared. I know. It's just taking driving time to get there. I'm so scared. I'm just. Oh, listen to me. I got. I got grazed by a bullet. She said she got grazed by a bullet when he started firing, and she ran to the neighbors. But he blank, he he point blank shot my friend that was right in front of me. I mean, I'm I'm scared to death Amanda? for my life. Is that Amanda? He shot a man. He shot Amanda and he shot Lindy Dobbins, our other friend that was there with us. I'm hiding in a closet at the neighbor's house. I'm scared to death. Okay. What's your name? My name is Rachel Hendricks. Oh my God! This is the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire life. Yeah.
It was just such a tragic and appalling and just shocking incident of um, domestic violence. Um, really was off the scale. Information about a deadly rampage in a St. John's County neighborhood. Investigators say James Colley shot and killed his wife and her best friend in the Mirabella neighborhood. This case took over the local news when it happened. We were intensive covering the aftermath. Several detectives are here. They're inside the home right now. Breaking news right now. Three St. John's County schools are on lockdown as police look for a shooter. And our fear was that he was going to go take the kids. Investigators are still actively searching for James Colley. We learned that he left the residence. He called his dad and his sisters and, and told them that he had shot Amanda and killed her. What's your name, sir? James Colley Sr. What did, what did your son tell you when he called you? He told me he shot two people. Was that his exact words, or? Yes, he said, Dad, she, she put me back in jail. Said, I can't handle it no more. Said, I don't know what to do. He said, you know, it's over. Said, I've tried to do everything I could, but she keeps on putting me in jail, aggravate me, and just won't let it go. He said, so I've done what I had to do. And he then went and got some items from his sister's house and began fleeing out of the state of Florida and went northbound. It was not a whodunit. It was a, we need to find James Colley and put him in jail. I've got a report of a complainant. The first sighting of James Colley after the murder was in Virginia. There was a vehicle with Florida tags following her, attempting to run her out of the roadway. A woman was driving and he was behind her and continually trying to run her off the road. He just had me come to a complete stop in the road and tried to get me. I had three small children in my car. So police caught up and conducted a traffic stop on him and took him into custody. He was intoxicated. He didn't resist their efforts, but he was definitely intoxicated. I drove here from Florida um, 10 hours to talk to you, um, to get some answers, get your side of the story of everything that happened there. He knew where I was from and I read him his Miranda rights and he immediately said that he wanted an attorney. Which I think you're gonna need to take me back to Florida okay. so I can have an attorney before I talk to anybody. It was a very uneasy feeling being near him and I'd been around many people who have committed similar crimes, but he had he had a different aura about him. Creepy. Pretty early on, the horrific nature of these crimes, the type of crimes, we as prosecutors were already thinking ahead of, you know, this could potentially be a death penalty case. And then our job ultimately became proving that it was in fact a premeditated murder. But in order to get the death penalty, we have um, cold calculated and premeditated as a factor and a motive and exactly how many opportunities Mr. Colley had to stop and change course. Collie got the photo of Lamar mowing the lawn just a few days before the murder from his neighbor, Mike Dickens. This is why I wanted to find out, was she cheating? Right. You know, and that's why I took that picture. And I'm like, what? He said, man, all this s and and all this stuff. I'm like, okay, James, big deal. Big deal. You knew she was cheating. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who the boyfriend is. She's cheating. You're going through a divorce. You filed for divorce. Leave her alone. Mm -hmm. And says, don't let this ruin your life. Lose a you know, mm -hmm. this was, you see what time it was. He didn't give me nothing that he was going to do something stupid. Hello, you have a prepaid call from James Colley, an inmate at Duffield Regional Jail Facility. Our investigators have access to jail calls. Colley was on the phone with his family almost every day after his arrest. Well, what kind of questions they ask you this morning? N nothing about anything like that, just, uh, have, uh, am I thinking about killing myself? No. You know, have you thought about killing yourself? No. Right. Are you sure you're okay, bud? All things considered? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, 
No, just a situation, but... Yeah. It's all right. It's okay. Collie wanted to know about his children. Yeah, they know Amanda's gone, but they don't know how she's gone. Right. Okay. Um, and the what do they think the about time. me? Trey looked at mom and and Johnny and he said, you know what, Uncle Johnny, I don't care what my daddy did. I'm going to love my daddy no matter what he did. And Collie urged his family to make sure Amanda's relatives did not get custody of the children. Well, that's, that's my only really concern on everything right. else. I don't really give a about to tell you the truth. Once my, kids are secured, yeah. once my kids are secured with you, I really don't give a what happens. Start throwing mud. Don't play nice. It does give you a very um, good insight, even if they're not talking about their case, into their personality type. Hey, is there, is there any football on the night? Ask them. Hey, Jared, when you're talking to that counselor, you just make sure that you don't say anything that will incriminate yourself with no. the others. I, I, I thought about it, and I was just going to say that, you know, what happened. And I, look, I don't remember anything from Thursday, and I kind of don't remember anything on Friday. I little bits and pieces, and then... Uh, you know, my memory started coming back, you know, my memory started coming back on Saturday pretty much and then all day Sunday and, you know. So we know about you just can't. I remember things like, I'm going to be out of here in less than 20 years. You really think he's going to get a manslaughter conviction out of this? I love all you guys. Well, we love you too. And you remember that, Bob, no matter what. We, we love you. I know. Hey, Jay, can we say a prayer real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Dear Lord, please watch over my brother and help him get home safely. Please watch over us and give us all strength to get through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 While in jail, Collie also talked a lot with one of his cellmates, Andrew Cherry. And Cherry was quick to become a jailhouse informant and tell prosecutors what Collie had to say about the victims. All the time. All the time goes around saying, I'm blah, 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 and cheating got what they deserve and all this other stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just real spiteful things. And who does he say that in reference to? The, Amanda the, and Lindy. That they got what they deserve. Mm -hmm. The decision was made to seek the death penalty with Lindy's 911 call a major factor. 911. Oh oh when a victim knows of their impending doom, their impending death that's psychologically heinous, atrocious, and cruel, that they're going through that mentally and they know they're about to die. She clearly knew she was going to die. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have now been selected as warrant as the jury to try the case of the state of Florida versus James Terry Colley Jr. We knew he was going to be convicted of something. The, the plan was try to save his life so he didn't get the death penalty. Our whole defense was this never would have happened but for, you know, the, the drinking the night before, the drugs the night before. We had to basically admit that he had committed the crime. So even before the opening statements, Collie had to agree to the defense strategy before the judge. Your lawyers will be admitting that uh, you committed uh, uh, for discharge a firearm that resulted in the death of the two folks. Uh, is that your understanding? Unfortunately, yes, sir. Okay. And the guilt was overwhelming, and so the penalty is really what this case was going to be about. All right, so you may present your opening statement. <laughs> You're f disgusting. That's what you are. Call me or I'm going to come find you. F whore. These are some of the last words Amanda Colley heard from her estranged husband on the morning she was murdered. I do it to grab their attention. I don't think there's any better words to use um, against someone than their own words. The state is confident that we will meet our burden in this case and that you will have no doubt no doubt that this is a case of premeditated murder and felony murder. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, the defense has an opportunity to present their own statement. Mr. Shoemaker, you may proceed. The question here is 
who did that. It's never been a question of who did that. The question is, why did it happen? How could this happen? How could a person that loved his family more than anything in his life do that? He started with an Ambien defense that he was under the influence of Ambien when all of this occurred. We believe that based on our witnesses, based on the medication that was on, based on everything that took place, we won't be able to come back with a first degree conviction. The prosecution's first witness was Rachel Hendricks. She was our eyewitness that put James Colley there. You saw Mr. Colley with a, a handgun in his hand when he was in the closet? Yes. And did you see him point at uh, Lindy? Yes, at her head. And nobody can tell that story like, like Rachel can. Uh, Mr. Colley was trying to get into the bathroom door, saying, open the door, open the door, I'm going to shoot. So the door came in on me. I backed, I, I backed up and let the door come in on me. And uh, Mr. Colley walked past the door straight over to Amanda. I mean, I'm sorry, to Lindy, who was kneeling down. Um, heard Lindy say, oh my God, no. And I ran out of the closet and heard a shot and ran out the front doors of the home. Do you see uh, James Colley in the courtroom here today? Yes, I do. He's sitting there. Is he sitting at the table? Yes, he is. And then the other survivor of the shooting. David Paul Lamar Dubberly. Amanda's boyfriend, Lamar Dubberly, the man seen cutting the lawn in the photo that so enraged James Colley. Is that up here, right here? Yes, sir. Um, I picked up this bullet hole about the same time second shot came through, which was all parked right in this area. And then I heard, um, where is he? Where is he? It was, it was faint. What did you do? I left. I, I, I thought that, that I was the, uh, the target individual. And so I wasn't armed. I left. On cross-examination, college lawyer Terry Shoemaker asked about Amanda's sex life. Were you aware of the fact that they were still having marital relations? We need, uh, I guess I'm done. They're, I mean, they're still sexually active. How's that? Oh, okay. Mr. Dobbley, were you aware of, uh, I guess, some sexual toys that had been, uh, that had been purchased by Ms. Collin? Yes, sir, she made it Did you ever see those? I never put my eyes on Do you know when she received those? Uh, I, I believe it was the weekend before. Yes, I'm assuming they were going to be used between you and Ms. Kyle. I, yes, sir. Okay. I assume so. They were just grasping at straws. Just shows how far they were reaching to try to find some reason of why he would be mad. That also was a dig to try to embarrass Amanda, you know, and, and to kind of tarnish her reputation or tarnish her image. On social media, the defense lawyer was attacked for what some saw as victim shaming. That's the last thing I'm gonna do is, is try, to, try to victim shame. I'm just trying to save JR's life to the best that I can. Day three of a high profile death penalty trial in St. Johns County. And the defense had to decide whether James Colley should testify. I think that uh, JR is um, charismatic enough. He could have possibly, you know, won over some sympathy votes. Um, but, you know, you never know. You know, you get up there and you have a prosecutor, you know, hammering it down your throat about calling your wife those names that you hear on the 911 call. So it was his choice at the end of the day not to testify. The defense case lasted less than an hour most of the time spent with Collie's sister, Rhonda. 
What was your role with us in the relationship? Um, I guess I was kind of the go-between, in between the two of them. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, my brother was telling me you were having problems. He thought they were having an affair. Paul Spitter said, sustain. I wanted to try to show that uh, as he was trying to save the marriage, Amanda was trying to get out of the marriage. All right, now we'll get started with the closing arguments. Okay, you may proceed. Thank you. The evidence you've been presented in this case overwhelmingly proves not only that the defendant committed these murders and all the other charges in the indictment, but why? He committed these murders and these acts because he was angered. Not a sudden anger, but an anger and a resentment that built over time. He committed these murders because he was rejected. Rejected by Amanda, asking you to return a verdict of guilty as charged as to all seven counts in the indictment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Just give me the fortitude that I ask for and I can move on. Just let me go. Those are the things that James Colley had been asking his wife for some time as he knew what was going on in her life. As he knew that there was a relationship between him, between her and another man. But she continues to tell him, no, it's not what you think. There's nobody else. And it was this emotional roller coaster, back and forth, back and forth, that led to these terrible, terrible events. Nothing was premeditated, nothing that was planned out. Just a snap reaction. And because of that, I would ask you to return a verdict of second degree murder. Thank you. We will now proceed with the state's final closing argument. State, you may proceed. Thank you. The defense just told you that Amanda Colley is the reason why, that she is the reason this happened. She didn't give him the fortitude he needed, she didn't tell the truth. She wouldn't confirm what he already knew was true. It's her fault. That's what the defendant just told you. And he's here, as we know, to get across his point that she's evil, she's a bitch, and it's her fault. That's what he just stood up here and told you. All of uh, Amanda's family and, and Lindy's family and friends were there. They were dressed in purple um, because that was you know, sort of the color of domestic violence, remembrance. All right, Mr. Holly, do you stand in the and please read verdict, please? We the jury find the defendant, James Curry Colley Jr. as follows. Guilty as charged of both first degree premeditated murder and first degree felony murder, contrary to Florida Statute Section 782.04. And guilty on all the other counts, too. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. Once they started checking the guilty boxes, they just kept checking, you know? Kinda, he shook his head a little like I expected it, you know, something like that. the James Colley case, he was found guilty on all charges. He could face the death penalty. That same jury will have to determine what happens to him, and that penalty phase will begin today. Amanda's sister, Tammy Malone. She was smart, she was funny, she was kind, compassionate, and genuine. Her life mattered. It mattered to so many people in so many different ways. 
and he took that from all of us. Lindy's husband, Chris Dobbins. Little League baseball games are attended with an empty blue chair. <laughs> Collie's lawyer for the penalty phase, Gary Wood, thought his best case to prevent a death sentence was to present Collie as a man who was under the influence of Ambien. The Ambien is known to and did in this particular case cause Mr. Collie not to remember and not to be able to uh, perceive um, and deal with, uh, from a mental health perspective, the things that were going on that morning, including court, and the events as they unfolded in this case. Mr. Colley was substantially impaired at the time of the shooting, and that will be for your consideration. But in rebuttal, the prosecution played the video of Colley's court appearance just an hour before the murders. Are you now under the influence of any intoxicants? No and then called as a witness the judge who presided at the hearing, Charles Tindlin. Do you have any concerns over impairment or his ability to understand? I did not. I asked him if he was under the influence of any intoxicants. He told me he was not. There was no indication, nothing in his demeanor that indicated he was under the influence of anything. I knew exactly what he was going to testify to. I was hoping it wouldn't come across so strong for the, for the state, but it, it really did. It, it came across great for them. So, the defense was left with an appeal to the jury from Collie's sister, Crystal, who described family photos from a happier time. That is uh, my nephew, Trey, opening his birthday presents. He was an amazing father. Take your time. Yeah. This is father. The state, you may proceed with your closing argument. Amanda Colley and Lindy Dobbins were human beings and now they're dead. And they're dead because of one man. The choices that one man made, what the defendant did in this particular case was horrific. It was unnecessary. I'm asking all 12 of you, not because I think you should or anybody thinks you should, because that's the right thing to do. And it's going to require courage to do it. The defendant deserved the death penalty. He is to a human being in his life, in his career, in his family, I submit to you, should be taken in consideration and will be taken in consideration. <clears throat> if you impose a life without the possibility of parole sentence for these counts, he will leave, he will leave prison in a plain box. That's what that sentence guarantees. He's going to die in prison. That's what we're talking about. J.R. always believed that people would see the whole situation and that um, they, they couldn't possibly give him the death penalty based on everything that happened. It was a mistake, and, and he really thought people would see that. You know, something that just happened because of the circumstances that occurred on that day. Breaking news out of Florida right now. We're showing you a live picture out of the St. John's County courtroom uh, where it seems the jury has reached a verdict as to whether or not James Colley should get the death penalty. The all 12, it has to be unanimous. If just one person doesn't want to do it, you're, you're done. It's a life sentence at that point. State of Florida versus James Terry Colley Jr. We, the jury, unanimously find that James Terry Colley Jr. should be sentenced to death. 
judge in Florida can um, reduce a death sentence um, to life. This is going to be the last chance to say anything. This case is burned and this is just that. We desire to say anything to the court this morning. This would be a whole different thing. And I wish it would be different, but it's not. And I'm sorry for all of us. There was never an ounce of remorse that came from him. I think what he was trying, and obviously I can't put words in his mouth, but it was more of a, this is nothing that I intended to do, but it, it certainly didn't help his, uh, his sentencing. Uh, you've characterized what happened in this case as a horrible accident. Nothing could be more further from the truth based upon the evidence that was presented in this case. For the first degree murder of Amanda Colley, you are sentenced to death in the manner provided by Florida law. For the first degree murder of Wendy Dobbins, you are sentenced to death. <clears throat> You can see there the family of the victims, Amanda Colley and Lindy Dobbins, crying. And then on the other side of the courtroom, James Colley's family, he turns to them and says he loves them and gives them a wink as he is led away. I just prayed. I prayed and cried. It doesn't bring her back, but at least she gets justice. There is a a park there that they dedicated not long after the murder. You know, there's five children that lost their mothers on that day. So it it was, it's a generational grief. It's not something that's gonna go away for the family. So my hope would be that the right people would hear her story, would see this, and that at least take a look at the loss. I wish that there had been a mental health check-in with him. I wish that a deputy had escorted him home. Amanda had done what she could do within her rights within the law. And an injunction is just a piece of paper. What I would want the viewers to know, always take domestic violence seriously, to not take anything lightly, any act of violence, any act of aggression, to take it seriously because you never know at what point it might escalate and something happen like what happened to Amanda. Thank <laughs> you.